Well, I want to say a total thank you to Katie and everybody that's worked on this thing. I know there's so many you probably couldn't name all, but this has been absolutely amazing. I was a Skepticon virgin, so I've lost it. I've lost my cherry this time. And I am, I'm coming back. It's a great, great time. Uh, I have some folks that are going to help uh, lead us. Come on out, guys. We, uh, we want to uh, sanctify this moment here. And... And I've got these folks, this is my choir, they're going to help us say a very important prayer. Some of you have heard this prayer before, um, others of you. We want to take this prayer to the, on the road and let um, Baptists and Catholics learn how to pray. So, are you ready, folks? All right. Dear Flying Spaghetti Monster, we thank you for use of sex and sexuality, whether homo or hetero, bi or trans, and for make, making us like those uptight Christians, Muslims, Mormons, and Baptists. We thank you for wonderful masturbatory fantasies and for the pornography on which they're often based. FSM, we ask that you grant us sex partners, lovers, wives, and husbands that know where our G-spots, clitoris, and sweet spot on our penis are. <laughs> Grant us long, loving foreplay with deep, wet kisses, followed by huge orgasms and loving cuddles after. Grant us the courage and wisdom to communicate openly and honestly with our partners and give them more pleasure than we receive. For we know it is better, better to give than to receive. Your noodliness, we do not need 72 virgins. In fact, we ask that you send us no virgins, for we don't want to have to train them. <laughs> Unless, of course, they are very willing to be trained. <laughs> We especially plead today that you not send any repressed Christian virgins, male or female, for they will only feel guilty and cause great problems with their abstinence-only training. Your posthumous, we ask that you give us the wisdom to understand and appreciate our partner's kinks or lack thereof, whether foot worship or spanking, Ropes are talking dirty. Help us to appreciate their full sexuality and lead us not into temptation of judgment and scorn for others when their sexual preferences are not ours. We do ask in the name of Roman for retribution, shame, and scorn on the pedophile priests, hypocritical ministers sleeping with the choir director, and gay-bashing closeted ministers, etc. Oh, SpaghettiO, we ask that you send condoms and birth control in abundance and your blessings on the many dedicated workers at the Trojan Condom Factory and Planned Parenthood. <laughs> In the name of Dan Savage and Greta Christina, we pray, <laughs> for they are the true gods and goddesses of this world. May his newly appendage touch you. Amen. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you. <laughs> Go uh, down there. <laughs> All right. Well, Amanda's wandering around because I told her to be keep herself handy. So I want to recognize her in a minute. So uh, we're going to move on and uh, <laughs> learn. <laughs> yeah, well, that's just... I couldn't resist that. I thought that was a great introduction here. All right, so the objectives we're gonna, of my talk today are to uh, do an overview of the recent sex research that we did 
and uh, look at the implications for us as, as um, agnostics, atheists, seculars. Religious people live a lie. And it's very, very easy to prove, even to them. I have been kind of interested in, the, in how easy it is to show how, how much they live their own lie. But of course, it's, it doesn't necessarily change their minds. But what happens when you no longer have to live that lie? And that was what I was curious about. And I uh, wanted to know, how many of you masturbate? I do. How many of you masturbate here? OK. I see a few people with both hands up. Does that mean you're ambidextrous? <laughs> there we go. Ambidextrous over there, right. So can you imagine asking that question in a Catholic mass? Or, or how about in a Baptist Sunday school class, you think? What would happen? We know. 90, I, I studied with a great psychologist, psychotherapist, Albert Ellis, back in the late 70s. And he had a famous saying. He said, 97% of men admit to masturbating, and 3% are lying. <laughs> well, we know everybody masturbates. All primates masturbate, and virtually all humans. Women might not masturbate quite as much as men, but we know they're doing it. And yet, they have to go to Sunday school and church and act like, I never do that. My hands aren't hairy. <laughs> so, uh, here's what Mark Driscoll said just about two weeks ago, the head of the mega church, Mars Hill. Masturbation can be a form of homosexuality because it's a sexual act that does not involve a woman. Doesn't say anything about the women here, of course. If a man were to masturbate while engaged in other forms of sexual intimacy with his wife, then he would not be doing so in a homo he would be doing so in a homosexual way. However, any man who does not who does so without his wife in the room is bordering on homosexual activity. Particularly, get this, particularly if he's watching himself in the mirror and turning on by his own body, male body. So we know, <laughs> you can't make this shit up. <laughs> and this was just like two weeks ago, this, this guy said this. So isn't that amazing? So most of you guys in here are gay or close to it, which is great with me. <laughs> Eric, keep down, down boy, down. All right. So they, they are living a lie. This, this man has masturbated. I have no doubt in my mind. And most of the people in his congregation are doing it, you know, at least once a week, maybe once a day. Some maybe even more than that. He doesn't even talk about women, and we know women masturbate. So, have you ever had premarital sex, or do you believe in premarital sex? Oh. <laughs> right on, all right. <laughs> now, can you imagine asking that in a Mormon temple? Or in a Muslim, uh, in, you know, in, in a Muslim place of worship? No, you couldn't. But we know they're doing it. We know people are having premarital sex all over the place. The research shows, not just our research, but all the research you can find with the Pew Trust, the Eris surveys, all these national random surveys show that probably 95% of Americans have been having premarital sex since the 1950s. The data has just been very consistent. So what we do know, and this is a fact, the 5% who are not having premarital sex are the Catholic priests, ministers, and nuns. Those are the only ones that aren't having premarital sex. Baptist ministers, particularly, don't have premarital sex. Does your God watch you while you're having sex? Uh, do you feel guilty because of that? I once had a girlfriend. I dated for a few months. She was a good Catholic girl. And I was kind of in the closet atheist at the time. And we'd, we usually came to my house to have sex. But one day, I, this is before cell phones, I showed up at her house, unexpected. And I'd been there many times. I'd never noticed any particular religious stuff in there. And uh, I get there that day, and I look in, and there's a crucifix, and there's a Mary, and there's all sorts of stuff in the bedroom. I'm thinking, where did this come? And I asked her, what's all this religious stuff? And she looks at me and sincerely says, I just can't come with Jesus watching me. <laughs> so, you know, atheists, don't, atheists and secularists don't seem to have this problem. At least that's what our research indicates. Now, Amanda Brown, where's Amanda? I want you to give her a big hand. She's been a big help. I was, I was giving a talk, I don't remember what it was, the God virus or some other thing, and uh, Amanda comes up to me after at Kansas University and said, you know, 
years, I handed out a little survey. I was trying to do some preliminary research. And in a very nice way, she came up to me and said, you know, your, your survey sucks. <laughs> I could help you with that. So she did. And we, we put together this great, great 69-question uh, survey. <laughs> And I swear that was an accident, but I think she had something to do with it. I don't know. I think it was. Anyway, I, we put this survey together. We put it out. We asked some bloggers to help us. Greta Christina helped us. PZ Myers, whoa, don't ask PZ to do something, because if he does, it goes crazy. Uh, <laughs> half of all of, of the responses came from PZ alone. But Jen McCrite put it up. American Atheist, Dave Silverman put it up. Atheist Experience put it up. I'm probably, I'm probably missing some because a lot of people picked it up and put it out. So in order to take this survey, you could only be a secularist. We didn't want any Catholics. We didn't Baptists. We didn't want anybody that was currently religious. We were, this is the first research that's ever looked at the sex life of, of non-religious people. And I think that's kind of interesting. I wanted to know, does it get better? And so let's find out here. Our survey found, uh, got 14,500, actually 14,560 people participated in the survey and 10,000 completed it, almost exactly 10,000. Now that's a very high percentage of completion, about 64%. That's very good for any kind of thing. It had 69 questions. We thought, figured it took at least 45 minutes to complete. So there, there's quite a bit of commitment to it. How many of you took the survey back in January? All right. Hey, that's why it was so perverted, I'm sure. All these folks over here on the right. All right. So the final research report, uh, it, it, we did the, we put it out in January, and the final research report took us forever to analyze. <laughs> we were snowed under with data. We had no idea we'd get that many people. We were hoping for a few hundred, maybe a thousand. And I woke up the second morning and 2,000 had taken it. We were hoping a hundred or two would have. And then when Manda said, well, you ought to send it to PZ, it, it doubled overnight from like 6,000 to 12,000. Uh, well, we, I looked at PZ's the next morning, and he, he had said something like, some pervert wants to know your sex life. <laughs> <laughs> and PZ said, I took it, and I thought I've got a very boring sex life. <laughs> Just saying, okay. It went viral. When we put the report out on May 15th, Greta Christina, where's Greta over here? I gotta say a big thanks to her. She, <laughs> she single-handedly fucked my life up for a whole two months. When she put that up, the Daily Mail picked it up, and I know the Daily Mail doesn't have a great reputation, but they got two million readers. And how many, how many internet people are looking at it? They picked up her article and, you know, really ran it all over the world. And then all of a sudden we're getting phone calls and emails and, and reporters from Chile. And they're taking and translating into 27 different languages. I think the last I looked, there was 1,200 news media picked up our, our report. And they mostly misquoted it. <laughs> they didn't read it. They read Greta and then they made up their own little story about it, I guess. But thousands and thousands, the New York Post, the Los Angeles Times, all came out. But the crowning glory was Playboy Magazine. We made Playboy Magazine and I still have my clothes on. And so did Amanda. So, yeah, the September edition of, of uh, Playboy Magazine. It's just a little three, three length inch thing, but hey, it's a start here. We had six hypotheses uh, we were testing. We were looking at is religion's use of sexual guilt and how, and we were gonna measure, we wanna measure the use of guilt. How many of you have read The God Virus? Okay, every one of you, you know what I'm talking about when I talk about the guilt cycle. So it's, a, it's a concept I've never seen anybody write or talk about before, but how the religion uses a cycle of guilt to keep you infected with a specific religion. And I wanted to test this because it was my clinical hypothesis, but I didn't have any hard data, and that's what Amanda and I were trying to do. Let's test the guilt cycle if we can. Uh, people feel sexual guilt taught by their religion but sexual behavior shows no difference from those with less guilt. There's hypothesis number two. Number three, religiously conservative parents are less effective at teaching their children about sex than more secular parents. Four, children raised in highly religious homes receive poor sexual education. Five, leaving religion has a positive impact on sexual satisfaction. 
And six, religion has continuing negative consequences on individuals after they leave. So those are our six hypotheses. So I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to just delve into some of the data here. And some of the interesting thing wasn't just about sex, because we, we collected demographic information. We know, we know people's gender. We know all sorts of things about them. We're, we, it was all anonymous, so we, we don't know exactly where they came from necessarily, but we know a lot about them. We know what former denomination they were, if they were raised up in a, in a church. So what we did is we looked at where did people come from uh, before becoming non-religious, what religion were you, and this is where it comes out. You can see that Catholic is 19.7% in this graph, and that's about, the uh, that's about the level it is in the general population, too. Christian non-denominational is 14.4% in our sample of... Now, these are former religionists. They used to be religious, but here's the kicker. 14.4 is overrepresented. The not Christian non-denominational only accounts for 8% of the U.S. population which means these folks are coming to us in bigger numbers than the Catholics, even though they're both pretty good-sized numbers. And then you can see they're lifelong atheists. We said, if you, if you were an atheist since adolescence, then we count you. I don't care what religion your parents were or what they tried to do. If you, were, if you never believed it from 14 or 15 on, then, then we, we let you in the atheist group. Uh, there was a bunch of people said blank. We, so you can see kind of the, the sampling that we got here. So, before becoming non-religious, here's what they currently describe themselves as. 80% atheist, uh, about 10% uh, or so didn't give us any, uh, anything, and then the rest of them, they just left it blank, and then that's the rest of them. So, we're going to test the guilt cycle in this process. And, and the, one of the ways we're going to do this, we, we tried testing the guilt cycle in a whole lot of different ways. and found some amazingly good confirming evidence in, in our research. But uh, we asked, how, what kind of sexual guilt were you taught in, the ho in your home of origin on a scale of 1 to 10? A 1 would be, my, I didn't, we didn't get any guilt in my home. And a 10, extremely guilty stuff. And then we took it and said, okay, well, let's look, that, look at it by denomination. And here's what we came up with. By denomination. Now, I'm going to go back here. I, I'm sorry. I, I, I got too quick. I want to ask you to guess. Who, who do you guess is the guiltiest Sexually guilty Catholics. Yeah, yeah, Catholics. No doubt about it. Catholics. Who, who would you say is number two? Baptists? Okay. You're all wrong. If you'd have just listened to Dave, you'd know the answer to this question. The Mormons. Mormons right here. Mormons on a scale of 1 to 10 score, these are former Mormons, an 8.19%. Those Mormons are terrified of sex, it appears to us. Now, this is the kind of guilt they were taught as children, not necessarily where they're at now, but with the children. We can see the Jehovah's Witnesses are just behind them a little bit. Pentecostal, Seventh-day Adventists. These four look a lot like cults, just based on the guilt scores. But not so far behind them are, as you guys noted, Baptists, Mennonites, Church of Christ, Catholics. There's clear down here at about the 60% level. What we think is going on there is, most of the people were raised as cafeteria Catholics in the first place. Their mom, their parents use birth control and don't really follow what that man in a black dress in Rome says. So I think the whole Catholic guilt thing is probably, at least for our sample, is not as true as, as our culture tends to think. I'm a little suspect on some of them. We didn't get a big sample of Hindus or Islams, but if we got 25 people or more, we included them, even though, you know, might be suspect. But look down here. What is going on? Unitarians. What's with these Unitarians? They got less guilt than the rest of us. They must be having orgies every Sunday. And they weren't doing it at the churches I've attended. I'm coming to your church. <laughs> I told, thanks for coming, guys. How many Unitarians we got? Ooh, gosh, we got quite a few here. Great. Well, so I'm giving my talks around the country, and I'm saying, what's going on with Unitarians? Why are they lower than atheists and agnostics? I couldn't figure it out until one person told me, we have this great sex education program in the Unitarian Church, and it's very sex positive and gender neutral, and you know, all the things we would like as secularists. And I thought, well, you know, we atheists don't have a place to send our kids to get good sex education. So there's one reason to join the Unitarian Church. Send your kids to their sex education. 
Now, I'm not joining because my kids are already grown, but anyway, that, that's a little plug for you guys. You, you owe me for that. All right. You'll notice in the previous graph that the fastest growing religions are also the ones that are using guilt the most. That is a test of the guilt cycle. Now, let me explain what the guilt cycle is for those of you who have not read the God Verus yet. Uh, you go, when you're a little kid, and your mom says, don't put your hand in the cookie jar. Well, you know, you like cookies, so you put your hand in the cookie jar. She catches you. She slaps her hand and says, don't do that again. So you say, okay, mom, I won't do that again. The next day, just before supper, you're pretty hungry, you want a cookie. She's not looking, so you put your hand in the cookie jar, and you eat the cookie. Man, it tastes great, and mom doesn't catch you. But there's a little twinge going on there. And that twinge is cognitive dissonance. And it's expressed in the form of what we call guilt. So I, there's a rule mom told me not to, and I violated the rule. The emotional expression is guilt. That's pretty common. I'm not a big fan of guilt. I don't think it's a particularly helpful emotion in most cases. But religion's figured out it's a very helpful guilt. It's a very helpful emotion if you use it right. So what a religion does is come along in the guilt cycle, uh, tension, and behavior, guilt, tension, behavior, guilt. It's a circle. And religion comes and puts a little loop on this circle over here and says, we're going to teach you to be guilty about having sex. We're going to teach you about masturbation. We want to make you feel guilty about masturbation. We want to teach you to feel guilty about premarital sex. We want to teach you to feel guilty about having fantasies or using pornography, you name it. We're going to teach you all this guilt. And then when you do it, you can come to us for forgiveness. Just come and confess your sins to the priest. Or come and confess your sins during Bible study or read the Bible more. Go to Bible uh, prayer meetings or any of that stuff and you can get relief from your sins. But the church taught you the disease and now they're going to give you a fake cure. And that's the way the guilt cycle works. There's one important component of the guilt cycle. Have you ever noticed that Baptists don't go confess their sins to Catholic priests? And Catholics don't confess their sins to Muslim imams. The only place you can get rid of your guilt is at the place you learned it. That's how the cycle works. It keeps you infected with the guilt. It keeps you infected with the religion that you learned the guilt from. So that's why we're, I'm so concerned about testing the guilt cycle. Look at the high, fast-growing and most cult-like religions up here, and they also have the highest guilt scores. Interesting, I think. Fascinating. When religious, were you guilty about a specific activity or desire? And we've got clear evidence here that there's a lot of difference in guilt. The least religious group said yes to that question 26% of the time. The most religious said 79%. And what we're doing here, I've switched real quick. What we're doing is just splitting the population of 14,500 people, most of whom answer, answer this question, into two groups. Those who said uh, their uh, guilt was... Um, the religiosity was a one, two, or three, and we're bouncing them off to those who said they were an eight, nine, or a ten. Most religious against the least religious, and we see really clear differences in the use of guilt and how much guilt uh, these people were being taught. Does guilt prevent or stop sexual behavior? Now this, I don't know if you can see it very well, but I'm going to go through this. We, Amanda and I wanted to know where certain kinds of sexual behavior began so we've, we've sliced and diced this, four different levels of sexual activity against three different levels of, um, of age, age group. And we can see that masturbation, 83% of people who are highly religious being raised, they, were, they score an 8, 9, or a 10 as religious as children. These people at, uh, are saying they've started masturbating at 83% at 15 years of age. The non-religious said 86.7%. So there's a 3.7% difference between the kids who are being blasted with anti-masturbation messages and those whose parents, frankly, didn't care how many times you jacked off a day. So isn't that interesting? Look at the masturbation uh, on, on the next one. Religious at 18, very religious, still at 18, 90% are masturbating by that time, 92.8% of the secularists are masturbating at that time. And you can go over here to 21, you know, the virtual is the same, 94 plus, uh, plus uh, 90, 96. So there's no difference, there's virtually no difference in masturbatory activity of children who are raised religious versus non-religious. Well, how about 
How about petting? Same thing. How about oral sex? You know, when did you start giving your first blowjob? Right? Look at this, 18 and 20. The most religious kids are having oral sex at 18.6% and the least religious at 20. At age 15. <laughs> so it doesn't matter how, what, how much Sunday school you get, you're still going to go out and start behaving in that way. Look at same thing, oral sex here, 55 and 62. This is the one spot where we see a difference. And this is where religion is probably pounding kids the most, at mid, early to mid-adolescence. And that's when you're getting the abstinence-only training and promise rings and all that other kind of crap. But even though they're getting all these messages about don't, 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 55.1% of them are still doing it. That's a majority. And it's not that much. It's only 7% difference. A billion dollars of your taxes went to abstinence-only training, and that's all they can show for it. Yeah, that's all they can show for it. Isn't that amazing? Now, we got, we got quite a bit of criticism. Oh, this isn't a random sample and all that kind of stuff. Nobody can do random samples on sex research. I mean, the minute we ask somebody, some Baptist, when did you start masturbating, they're going to hang the phone up on us. So there's just almost no way to, to really get good standards. But what we can is compare our research to loads of other research that's been done in the same area and see if ours jives, and it does. It jives almost down to the percent in some areas. But what we do know is um, abstinence-only training shows that uh, onset of actual sexual intercourse, which is down here, is delayed by three to five months for kids that were sent through abstinence-only training. So that, that's what your billion dollars bought, was three to five months of less fucking. But when they... <laughs> But when they start, they do it without condoms and without birth control. And so that same, the, those who go through abstinence-only training are most likely to have uh, STDs or uh, pregnancies or, you know, or other complications because they're not using safe sex practices. So we can see not much difference here. These two groups are virtually the same. And what it tells Amanda and I is biology happens. This is not a cognitive thing. You can't teach kids not to have sex. Their, their bodies got hormones raging, and they're going to do it. So let's ask about pornography. One of my favorite things, uh, obviously. I went, and got a, I went and got a Playboy magazine, and I bought it for the articles, by the way. <laughs> That's the first time in my life I've ever bought a Playboy magazine for the articles. <laughs> Does religiosity impact porn use? Let's look at the... Uh, uh, where, we asked the question, where do you get your sexual information? And there's, uh, we gave them a long list of places they could get their information from, and we let them choose three in our service. So the, the, the numbers are going to add up to more than 100% in many cases. But peers, these are the least religious group, kids raised by pretty secular parents probably, and they are showing 75% of their information came from peers. Uh, internet, I mean... Um, Learn, going out and actually going in the back of the car and kissing, making out, petting, or screwing, 42.4%, says the secular kids. Parents, 38% of you folks, these, if you're a parent secular and you fall into this group, 38% are teaching their children, uh, they're getting information from their parents, and fourth, I won't go into all of them, but uh, learn stuff off the internet, 27%. Now, these are the kids raised the least religious. Let's see what the most religious kids did. Uh, so, top... Top ones. I, I'm ignoring the first, peers, because we all know peers where everybody gets most of their information. But those are the three. We're going to look now. Uh, I'm sorry, porn, I said pornography. Is that what we're looking at here? So 25% of the least religious kids. Where are the high religious kids? 70% said they get it from peers. No surprise. Experience. Going out and doing it. These are the most religious kids. These are the ones that have been put through abstinence-only training. As parents say, don't, 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 don't. And yet, 50% of them, that's, that's 6 7% higher than the non-religious kids. That's amazing to me. In other words, it kind of gives us a hint that the more religiosity you've got, the more you're going to go do the thing you're not supposed to be doing. This is actually a test of the guilt cycle. You wouldn't think it, but if you think about guilt drives behavior. If you're really guilty about something, you want to do more of it, don't you? You can't get your mind off of it. I don't want to masturbate. I don't want to masturbate. And then you succumb. Then what do you do? You have to go, go to confess. We have a Baptist, I mean, a Baptist priest. We have a Catholic priest, ex-Catholic priest in one of our groups. 
And he tells a hilarious story. He went all the way through seminary, and he could only go about 30 days without masturbating. And he'd finally succumb and masturbate. And, oh, I'm going to go to hell. So he'd have to, go, have to go find a priest and confess. Another 30 days would go by. He'd jack off again. Oh, no. I better. This went on for eight years through seminary until one day he was at a zoo and he noticed the chimpanzees jacking off. <laughs> and he thought, they're primates. I'm a primate. The Pope believes in evolution. That was his journey. That was, he said that was the first step to atheism for him. <laughs> I love that. The zoo, uh, chimps at the zoo converted him. There's a first there. So we can see that experience. Religious kids are actually going out and doing something that they've been told not to. Now, what about pornography? Look at this. They're actually using pornography more than the, the, the less religious kids. And parents, they're getting their information, 13.5% from parents. Now, the previous graph you saw was 38%, which is nothing to write home about, but 13 from religious parents. And they're the ones that say, don't give sex education to our kids. We want to do it at home. Well, they're not even doing it at home. And what are they doing at home? We, Amanda and I got, uh, gave people a lot of opportunities. We didn't just ask them to do a 1 to 10 or yes, no. We actually gave them lots of opportunities to write comments. We got 4,000 comments. We haven't even come close to analyzing all the textual data in this stuff. But what we did find was the kids that did get information from their religious parents basically got information, condoms don't work, don't have sex, you know, just negative sex negative messages. So, I mean, this is, this is incredible. It really shows that guilt is having an effect, but the opposite effect. And here's a theory I'm working on right now. Why aren't religious parents talking to the kids about sex? Because they were fucking before they got married, and they can't admit it to their children. 95% of people have premarital sex. Even if they married the person they had the premarital sex with, it's still against Jesus' law. And now you're raising kids. Kids come to you. I had one client, uh, patient, come to me and say, well, I can't talk to my kids because if they ask me, ask me about uh, my premarital sex, if I, if I tell them I, my, her, my, or their father and I were having sex, then I, I would be guilty of what I tell them they're not to do. And if I lie to them, I'd be guilty too. So there's no way out. In other words, as I said at the very beginning, parents, religious parents have to live a lie. They did it, and now they're going to tell their kids not to do it. I think this is fascinating for me. Now that you're non-religious, how has your sex life changed? Let's look at some of us in here. Obviously, some of you took it. So much worse, a, 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 a one would be much worse, and a ten would be much better. Here's what we found. One of our respondents sent that to me. Uh, I thought that was a great, uh, a great answer. She's a former uh, Pentecostal, I think it was. So here's what they told us. 54.6%, 54.6% of the people who've left religion told us that uh, their sex life had improved in 8, 9, or 10. A 5, a 5 means it didn't change. It was those people who left Unitarianism. It didn't, nothing. <laughs> There's nothing there. <laughs> But we were, you'll notice there's, it's just nothing here, and then there's 2.2% over here. So Mandy and I were really curious, what's going on with those 2.2%? And what we, we got in, we looked at the comments, and we got, some, we got some tragic comments and some hilarious comments. One of, the, one of the tragic comments was, I told my wife as an atheist and she won't sleep with me anymore. Yeah. Well, that wasn't the funny one, I didn't think. But <laughs> the funny one was, one guy is in his early 20s, said, I used to be able to lay every girl in the Sunday school class, and now they won't speak to me. <laughs> so, uh, after religion, how did your sex life improve by denomination? This will tell you where to get out of and where to stay. So, so we can see if you're an atheist, agnostic, you're Unitarian, or we had a very small sample of Hinduism, and I'm suspect on that because it was so small. And Judaism was pretty small too. I think we got a lot of reform, um, yeah, liberal, liberal Jews, former liberal Jews. We didn't get any Orthodox Jews. 
So uh, this, this group right here, you know, if it's a five, it, it's a scale of one to 10. So a five is not actually the midpoint. It's like 5.5 or so. So these are all basically no change right in here. No change at all when they left religion. Look down here. The Jehovah's Witnesses. They are screwing, they are fucking people up better than any. <laughs> this is the number one fucking up religion. And uh, Mennonites, Mormons, Seventh-day Adventists, and Pentecostals are right behind them. So that's, that's um, pretty clear. You can see those five are clearly outliers. They're much higher, significantly higher than the others. And then we got uh, Baptists and Nazarenes and Orthodox Christians and uh, so forth. Catholics show up right here. It's, you, do, do, you do get a 6.7 sex bump if you leave Catholicism, but it's just it's not as big as, as what we might have expected you know, some, from some of the mythology going on around. So Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons... Seventh-day Adventists and Pentecostals. I am a bit sus, uh, suspicious of the Mennonite because, we, again, we only had a very small sample there, 20, 25, the minimum is what we had. So those, clearly, we had hundreds, hundreds in those categories. So I, I trust that data a, a bit more. So what is normal among seculars? Kind of switch gears here and find about, you know, what you guys are all about. What was that? Chains and whips. Well, the ropes, uh, Dave Silver, or uh, no, PZ took the rope with him, so I'm sorry. Can't, can't, can't help you with that today. <laughs> so we're going to talk about sexual entertainment. What do we like to do for fun sex-wise? And uh, what we find is women like, these are secular women here, and our, our data was 70% male and 30% female, which seems to be across the board, it's all across the atheist world. There seems to be 70% male, 30% female, although I think that may be changing. And we went out of our way. Uh, Amanda and I thought of every way we could to reach out to women secularists, because we didn't want that um, imbalance, but it, it didn't work. I, as much as we tried to reach out to, to uh, female secularists, we didn't get as many, any more than other researchers have gotten. But those 30% gave us, I mean, 30% of 14,500 is quite a few. And uh, here's what they told us. Women like erotic novels with, you know, with a plot, 49.5%. They like um, DVDs, movies with a plot. <laughs> they do like Playboy or Penthouse or whatever equivalents there are for 40%. And they like internet shorts. Now, internet shorts are the ones, you know, get five or ten minutes, enough to get yourself off, and then you can go back to work, or whatever you need to do. And those, those are pretty popular, but they're only 36.5% uh, for those. Uh, Amanda says this is her favorite, and she was quite shocked that women didn't like them more than her. I'm not revealing too much here, am I, Amanda? <laughs> I like this the best myself, but so. All right, now let's look at what men say about it. If you just take the women and reverse them, that's what you got for men. Men like the erotic, I'm sorry, whoa. There we go, I'm sorry. Okay, men like the internet shorts, 71%. <laughs> and uh, they like the pictures, not far behind, 69%. And uh, the uh, films, DDDs with a plot, 61%. But man, those guys don't like reading. Functionally, erotically illiterate. So, Dave Fitzgerald, if you're trying to sell novels, be sure and write to the women, because the men here are not going to buy your stuff. This is good market research for Dave. Where are you, Dave? And, and Greta, you, know, you probably already know this, so I'm not I'm speaking to the choir there. So anyway, I think we haven't really uh, exploited this yet, but I think there's some real market research that could be done off of this stuff that tells who we are, secularists. All right, so uh, is there a difference in the, in the beginning and use of porn according to, to uh, religiosity? Because all sorts of religions say porn is bad, porn is bad, don't use it. So let's find out if those people raised most religious use porn as much or as, le as little as, as the least religious do. And here's a graph. I know it's a bit hard to read, but uh, the least religious is blue, the most religious is red. And you'll notice there's not a lot of difference here. 
And yeah, they're behind. The most religious are behind at age 9 to 12. And they're still a little bit behind age 13 to 15. But at 16 to 18, those religious are blowing us away. And by 21, look at that. They just keep getting more and more and more. By the, by the, age, um, by the age 30... Religious and not, you, there's almost no difference between religious and non-religious people. You, no matter what you were raised, you were all using pornography by that time. Now, we did find differences in genders, but we didn't find much difference by religiosity, what you were raised. So if you were raised really, really religious, you were looking at Playboy just like the kid down the street who wasn't raised religious. That's what we found. Uh, and there's confirming evidence for a lot of what we're, gonna, we're talking about here. The ARIS survey, the absence only government, billion dollars, I mentioned earlier. There's a great book just came out this year called Billion Wicked Thoughts. It's a great read. It's uh, using internet searches to really understand what people are looking at. It's kind of scary. <laughs> but you know, there's no way to hide this. There's no way to fake it because these people are paying porn sites to look at things. People don't pay for stuff unless they really want to get in there. But it's kind of interesting. The Barna research, uh, Barna research and other research, uh, and Barna is very conservative, very religiously conservative, fundamentalist evangelical, and the Schaefer Institute. All of these groups that are looking at sexuality and religion, they're getting the same results we are. Now, we're the only ones looking specifically and closely at uh, secularists, though. So here's some of the comments we got from our respondents. Of the 4,000 comments we got back, I'm not afraid to have sex now. I don't feel guilty about masturbating, and I don't feel bad about any uh, bad anymore about sucking my friend's cock. <laughs> On a side note, I would like to mention he was the preacher's son at the church I was attending. <laughs> this one, this one is scary because it shows the abstinence only mentality. There was a large space of time between becoming sexually active and becoming non-religious. During that time, I put myself at unnecessary risk of disease and pregnancy. While I was religious, guilt kept me from talking basic, taking basic precautions like birth control or condom use. To me, using any sort of contraceptive was tantamount to admitting that I was planning for and indeed desirous of sexual activities. Deciding not to use contraception allowed me to convince myself that my pleasure was a side effect of fulfilling my boyfriend's uh, desire for sexual activity. This is dangerous. This is what abstinence only does to people. And we got a lot of that kind of comment. But the United States government's abstinence only research shows exactly this comment. It, she, it, it's been reproduced over and over again. So within our sample, there, there's some conclusions that we can draw. First of all, the best thing you can do for your sex life is get out of religion. <laughs> Unless you're a Unitarian or some of those other liberal, you know, you're not going to get much of a benefit by leaving Episcopalian as, you know, Christianity light or whatever those are. So, but the higher end ones, virtually every major religion in the United States, you will get a, a nice one to three point bump or even more in your sex life. Number two, don't marry a religious person. Do not, because we found uh, all sorts of data that shows if there's a religious discrepancy in the in the spouses, there is a big difference in sexual satisfaction. Mary, uh, the spouse's religiosity, we asked people, how religious is your spouse? If they said, my spouse is, these are atheists. You know, people we're talking to are all, all secularists. If, you're, if, they, if they evaluated their spouse at an 8, 9, or a 10 in religiosity, there was a 76% chance that they rated their sex life a 1, 2, or a 3. So that's pretty big. Don't be marrying religious people because they're so damn guilty. They can't, you know, they can't do what you want them to do. I don't know if you've ever noticed, but religious people are, can oftentimes be very sexually open until they get married, and then it all clams shut. That was a bad one. Okay. <laughs> there is, so there's an inverse relationship uh, in religiosity and sexual satisfaction. Uh, in, in the groups that we saw. We found that sexual guilt does not change behavior. The more guilty you are, doesn't make a bit of difference. And of course, we can see all this. There's a Francis Schaeffer Institute, the most conservative institute you can think of, came out with a survey just last year 
of 1,050 fundamentalist evangelical ministers. And they asked many questions, but one of the questions was, have you ever had sex with somebody in your congregation? Not your wife, or of course most of them were men, all of them were men. 40% admitted to it. 40% said they had had sex with a parishioner. And I'm thinking that's underreported. Probably 60 or 100%, I don't know. It's hard to tell. But once again, we can see biology happens. Sexual guilt doesn't do anything but make people feel bad. So therein lies the, the uh, answer. Religion doesn't, doesn't want to stop you from masturbating. It wants to make you feel guilty as hell so you'll come back to that particular religion. It's the perfect con game, psychological con game. I'm going to give you a quote. I'd like you to just think about this, write it down, memorize it. You can take religion out of sex, but you cannot take sex out of religion. In other words, what if the Pope woke up one morning and said, wow, I had the greatest wet dream last night. I, I think we'll make masturbation legal. I don't, I don't think we're going to see that. Or Ted Haggard waking up and say, wow, that, that gay sex I had with that prostitute was really good. Let's make homosexuality. <laughs> no. Religions, religions need sex in order to stay viable. And therein lies my thesis that re sex is religion's weak spot. And we are actually helping them by not being open about our sexuality. If there's anything I've learned from the gay community is they, are, they have no problems exhibiting their sexuality, talking about their sexuality. I, is that? Yeah. And I love that. I love that about the gay community. And you know, we uptight heteros, we need to take a lesson from them. Because the, it's the Catholics saying, oh, you can't talk about that with other people, and you can't say this or that. Well, yes, you can. And yes, you can be open and honest about yourself. Now, I'm not saying being inappropriate and flashing people or anything. I'm just saying be, don't let them set the agenda. Um, and read. Read Dan Savage. Read Greta Christina. I, I think there's some great people out there right now that are doing good work in, in advising us. And I think we can take a hint from them. Be out about your sexuality. It's the biggest challenge to religion. If we nail religion around its sexuality, we have an enormous advantage. And I'm going to criticize, I, I'm gonna, here's my criticism of, of what's going on in, in, from our side. I think we go out and debate whether there's a God or not a God way too much. I'd rather ask, did your preacher masturbate last night? <laughs> I'd rather ask, do you think the preacher's wife used condoms with her boyfriend in Bible college? I mean, those are legitimate questions. And I know darn good well, my first wife went to Bible college, and I had to go there, Ozark Bible College, Joplin, Missouri, and she had to get down on her knees and see if, the, see if her dress hit the floor, and if it didn't, she had to go put a new dress on. And then she had to be in by 10 o'clock weeknights and 11 o'clock weekends. So, but every semester, girls disappeared. I don't know where they went. Every semester. Well, they're getting pregnant. There was as much sex going on in Joplin, Missouri, Bible college, as there probably is in Missouri State, it, biology happens. So let's be out about it. Um, if people ask, you know, I, I'd be right, do you fornicate? Well, absolutely I fornicate. It's a, it's, it's a lot of fun. Uh, sure, I, don't, I masturbate, don't you? If, you? if you're just nonchalant about subjects like that, rather than, ooh, you, I, you know, I don't want to offend anybody's feelings, I think there's opportunities for us to start questioning because these churches are telling kids wrong things. And I think we have as much right to correct those and talk out loud about them as they do. I mean, the churches are all saying you shouldn't masturbate like that one guy I showed you early on or shouldn't have premarital sex, and yet they're doing it anyway. I want to call them on their hypocrisy. So ask questions like, uh, did you know 95% of the Americans have premarital sex? Do you think your preacher had premarital sex? Do you think your Sunday school teacher had premarital sex? Who's telling you not to have premarital sex? And then I want to ask them, did they have premarital sex? And I want to watch them lie through their teeth. Because that's what they're doing. Christians, religionists of all types, live a lie. Do you think your uh, minister used condoms when he was in Bible college? Does he masturbate? Here's a theological question. Are there souls in zygotes? Which zygotes get souls? For every live birth, a woman has several zygotes that never implant and grow. Did they get souls? I mean, these are just... These 
casual questions, we could be asking them. I don't think we challenge them enough in this area. All right, are we ready with the offering? If we're ready for the offering? Well, Sam Singleton set a precedent last night. I saw a lot of money going in there. I'm thinking, shoot, I could take advantage of that. <laughs> so, uh, but being the kind of iconoclast I am, I thought, well, let's do a reverse offering. Are we ready? Okay, all right. Here is a reverse offering, folks. Please pass these along, and uh, I'll finish up while we're talking. <laughs> For those of you who haven't seen it yet, these are baskets of condoms. Take all you want. <laughs> and, and this all fits with where I want to wind up. Sex is fun. So is drinking. And we've done enough, at least one I know, this weekend. But here's the moral story. We still need to be responsible no matter what. There is no Jesus to forgive us if we hurt somebody. Sex and drinking are both fun. They need to be done responsibly. Use condoms. Take a look at the God virus. My next book is being called Sex and God, How Religion Distorts Sexuality. It'll be out January 10th. And I want to give a final plug. We got a, a table back there for our recovering from religion. I don't have time to talk about it, but I sure would like if you're interested in learning more about our recovering from religion, we're, there are thousands of groups that will get you into religion. We're the only one that will get you out. Thank you. <laughs> thanks, thanks. <laughs> All right, short break, and then we'll be back in 10 minutes. How was I on time?